Hello, everybody, and welcome to another live chat here on EPP Group Social Media. My name is Kevin Purcell. Today, we're going to be joined by EPP Group MEP uh, Peter Lisa, who has just joined. So we're just going to connect with him now. Hello, Peter. Hello. How are you? I'm fine, yes. Thanks for joining us today uh, for this uh, live uh, Q&A. Um, first of all, you're, I believe, in Germany. How are things going there? Yeah, we are quite happy. You know, um, I'm a medical doctor, and five weeks ago, I decided to go back to medicine to, to prepare myself because I didn't work a long time as a doctor. I was only a MEP. And I thought, if it's like uh, in Italy or Spain, you need every doctor. But fortunately, we are doing well in Germany. We have more than 5,000 people that died from COVID-19. That's a lot. That's why we should never underestimate this disease. But we kept it under control uh, so that our health care system is not overwhelmed. So we don't have uh, situations like uh, in Italy, Spain or France that we cannot treat the people anymore. So we are happy, but we are cautious. It, it may be worse, and that's why everybody has to take care, keep social distancing, and respect the hygiene uh, rules, and so on. And I believe some of the restrictions were eased in Germany this week. Uh, maybe bring us up to date about uh, what measures are in place there now. Yeah, so we, we still uh, have a lot of restrictions. So, for example, big shops bigger than 800 uh, square meters are not allowed to open. Restaurants are not allowed to open and many other restrictions. But I'm happy that we never had a complete shutdown. So, uh, for example, it was always allowed to go for a walk with your family or with another person. You were not allowed to have meetings more than two people that don't live together. Um, and uh, yeah, we are now in a situation, intermediate situation. Some shops are open, others are still closed, restaurants are still closed, churches are closed, but there will be some uh, lifting of the restrictions next week, so that with social distancing measures in place, you can have a mass in the church. And yeah, I think this is the right approach to not lift the shutdown at once, but be careful and go step by step. And Germany, as you mentioned, really got a handle on this early on. Um, what, what do you think Germany did that uh, other countries maybe failed to do? In a way, we were lucky because we have a very good institute for virology in Berlin and they cooperated with Wuhan. So they developed the test, they identified the sequence of the virus and so on. So they, they knew a lot more about the virus than others. I think they tried to share it with all Europeans, but it's clear when you have an expert in Berlin, he, he talks more to Angela Merkel than to other heads of state that they don't even ask him for advice. And that's why we were able to control the first outbreak. In January, we had the first outbreak, but obviously we kept it under control. There was no spreading of the disease anymore. And when the second outbreak came in February, we were much more, uh, much more alerted. We had already test capacities in place. We had already experts that uh, understood how one should behave. And that's why we were able to test much more people. And uh, if you test more people, you find more cases. Uh, and I'm sure that in many other countries like Italy, Spain, and the UK, we, we have much more cases, but they don't have enough tested to, to give these correct figures. And that's why it seems to be that the death rate in Spain, UK, and Italy is higher than in Germany. I think it's just the same, but we identified more cases, and that's why the proportion of identified cases and deaths is better in Germany than in these other countries. Uh, just for the people who joined, uh, you're very welcome to this live chat with uh, Peter Lisa, and you can ask uh, any questions 
um, just below here, and uh, we'll try and get to them. Um, Peter, you mentioned you returned um, to practice to, uh, as a medical doctor for, for, for a bit at the start of this crisis. Uh, how was that for you? Yeah, it was interesting. I understood that I know something and many issues that I learned uh, in former years, they came back to my attention. But I also know that uh, yeah, when you are many years in MEP, you are really depending on the advice of your colleagues. So I'm not a perfect doctor. Uh, I, I had to learn a lot and I would still have to learn a lot if uh, I would be asked to really work in, in an emergency case. But it was an interesting and refreshing um, moment also to see what uh, normal people think when they don't talk to an MEP. And when they talk to an MEP, they, they have another attitude. But when they talk to a doctor or a colleague, this is different. And I was suffering myself from the lack of protective equipment. So I had to do the first two weeks without a mask. And then people, friends, patients gave us a mask. And I was also witness that even though we do it quite well in Germany, that is also the, um, the judgment of international independent experts, people were not always happy. So they would like to be tested even more. Uh, so nothing is perfect, also not in Germany. Um, everybody knows that until or if we get a vaccine, this thing will still cause problems. From a medical point of view, maybe talk us through the process of getting a vaccine. I know there are many clinical trials underway. There's one, I believe, in Germany, the fifth authorized trial. Um, how long will this all take, do you think? Yeah, uh, first of all, I think we have also other measures. Maybe we talk about it later. So but the, the vaccine will, of course, solve the problem almost completely. But we have other ways and means which we should use to reduce the harm already before. Um, but uh, on the vaccine, so there are six uh, clinical trials authorized worldwide, two of them in China, two of them in the US, one in UK and one in Germany, but there are 80 projects. So that means that many, many scientists all over the world, also many of them with support of the European Union via the research program Horizon 2020, are trying to find out the vaccine. And one of those is in Germany. The clinical trial was authorized this week, but we have to be careful. You know, um, a vaccine that is approved, that is uh, approved by the European Medical Agency needs to be safe. Uh, there are man some people that say that vaccines anyhow are dangerous. This is wrong. When the European Medical Agency has checked it, the benefits are always better more important than the risk. That's why people should use the vaccines that are approved. But we are not yet there. You need first to test it with very few human beings. If there are any serious side effects, you stop the test immediately. If you have uh, no serious side effects with few people, then you go for large scale and you see is there also uh, really an effect? Are the people immune after the vaccination? And this unfortunately takes time. The bureaucracy, the paperwork is reduced to the absolute minimum. The European Medical Agency will, will do whatever they can to speed up the process. But you cannot speed up the testing too much because otherwise you may risk that people die from the vaccine or that the vaccine uh, doesn't really help and you feel protected, but you are not. So unfortunately, I think whatever we do, we will not have the vaccine available at large scale for all the Europeans this year. If we are lucky and we do the best we can, it may be the beginning of next year, um, but it may also be in the second part of next year. So only I can say we give money from the European Union and we work with the authorization uh, agency, with the EMA, to do it as fast as possible. So what can we do between now and then to try and minimize the risks? Uh, someone here uh, just asked about masks and the effectiveness of masks. What, do you, what kind of measures do you think we should be taking between uh, now and the, by the time we get a vaccine? First of all, before we have a vaccine, most likely, nothing is sure, but most likely we'll, we will have a medicine available 
that helps. It doesn't cure everybody, uh, but it maybe mitigates the effect so that maybe only half of the people that die now would die in six months from now. There are clinical trials ongoing and we need to be really working together. It's very important that all the member states work together to put their knowledge together. And then we would already be in a better situation. The second point is um, the mask. I think they can help. You should not avoid social distancing because you wear a mask. So, for example, if you are in a, uh, in a shop and wear a mask, it is, it is uh, not a reason to, to not keep the one and a half meter distance, but it gives additional protection. And especially when you just can't avoid the, the closer contact, uh, the mask would help. And sometimes it happens by coincidence that somebody falls and then you, you get in closer than one and a half meters. And the third point, and that is, I think, the most important point for the moment, those countries that have lifted the lockdown and at the same time don't have big figures uh, with new infections, they are using an app. For example, in South Korea. Yeah, in South Korea, there was never a real shutdown. Restaurants are open, shops are open with the mask and the social distancing. But on top of that, they have an app. And this is important because an app can inform people much faster than the health officials can. So if you um, have a positive test, and then somebody asks you, whom did you meet during the last week? And uh, at the moment, it's easy because we all are in social distancing. But if we go to subway again, if we go to buses, if we go to restaurants, then it may be more difficult to just remind whom I met. And the app can just inform the people in line, and that is very important, with European social, uh, with European data protection standards. Uh, the Korean solution is not a European solution because we have data protection. But it is possible, and I think that is a very important point, because not only for the economy, but also for people's personal life or for social life, it is important to reopen some of the institutions. So when people don't, when children don't go to school for one year, I think this is really dangerous as they, they miss track and uh, those young children that are anyhow in difficulties would be really in a big problem. So I think we need to lift the shutdown, but we can only do it in a justifiable way if we use the app. And just on the app, I mean, people are going to have concerns about privacy and mass surveillance and tracking locations. What, what, what do you say to them to, to allay their concerns about all of that? We need to take them serious. Because if people don't have trust in data protection, they will just not use the app. But I think there are many ways to ensure um, protection of data. And I'm very convinced that the data protection will be much better on this app than, for example, on WhatsApp, which many people just use and only a few are not using it. And so we will have better data protection. The only discussion among experts is do we have a decentralized or a centralized procedure? Both is possible with complete anonymous data, with no tracing of uh, personal data. But um, there's a bit a struggle, what is the best solution? And I think both are possible, but we need the solution. And there may be a zero, zero point zero one rest risk that some misuse is possible and the data are not 100% protected. But when you die from COVID-19, you are 100% death. And when you lose your job, you are 100% unemployed. So I think 99.99% data protection should be better than 100% death or 100% unemployed. On the general response from the EU to this pandemic, it got off to maybe a rocky start. Do you think the EU now is, is, is coordinated and on top of it? Yes, I think so. Um, it was difficult in the beginning, 
but I'm really impressed by Ursula von der Leyen, first of all. As far as I see, she's the only high-ranking politician that admitted that she underestimated the risk and that she excused with Italy. So I would like that people like Donald Trump, who much more underestimated the virus, that made much more mistakes, that they also admit a mistake and say sorry for those that are suffering, for example, now in New York. So Ursula von der Leyen did the right thing. And now she's working all day and all night, along with all the people in the commission, Vichy Sante, also ECHO, the humanitarian aid people. So they are doing whatever they can. And I think we have already achieved a lot with this European cooperation uh, after a difficult start. I would wish more, for example, only according to my knowledge, three member states in the European Union received patients from the most affected regions, for example, North Italy and East of France, or this is Luxembourg, Luxembourg, Austria and Germany. I think more, many more member states could do it. There are empty hospital beds in, um, for example, in Finland, also in Ireland, in Eastern Europe, so they should also help the most affected regions. And uh, that is something I would like to see more. But in general, the European Commission response is much better than it was uh, three, four weeks ago. And important as well in the exit strategy that things are coordinated between countries, uh, particularly when it comes to maybe reopening borders. Yes, definitely. You know, I live in North Rhine-Westphalia, the western part of Germany. We have a border to Netherlands and Belgium. And sometimes people have friends on the other side of the border. Then they have uh, their job in one country and they have uh, their house in another country. And when we don't have a coordinated response, uh, it doesn't work. So people lose trust and the virus doesn't respect borders. Uh, just getting to some questions. My next one, actually, uh, someone has asked there, and it's the, the, the threat of a second wave. I mean, people um, might be thinking restriction, restrictions are being eased and things are getting back to normal, but there is always the chance that this thing could come back and we could all be back in lockdown once again. Yeah, that's why we have to be careful. So the assumption that we have one lockdown and it is eased and then we go back to normal, this is unrealistic. We have a new normal unless we have a vaccine. So we will have a new kind of normality and we need to do it step by step. This is difficult because the, the one shop that is not allowed to open or the restaurant that is not allowed to open will always say, why? me is closed and the other shop is open but it is important to go step by step and not to to have a big surprise because we know more and more about the virus we we learn every day but for me it's still a miracle why for example in spain the figures exploded so when i was last time in brussels that was the 11th of march since that day i worked uh, in the practice and I worked in my home office. Um, but at that day, we all looked at Italy and nobody spoke about Spain. But only two weeks later, we had uh, as many people dying in Spain than in Italy. And I don't know why this happened and what we, what we overlooked. So, and, and if this is true, we should never be uh, too sure that, that we have it under control. We should always be careful. Which brings me to the next question about lessons being learned. I presume lots of lessons have been learned over the last uh, couple of months here. Yes, definitely. I think one important lesson is that health must get much more priority in the politics nationally and also European-wide. So when we as EP ask for an initiative of the parliament on the shortage of drugs, it was already evident before the crisis that some life-threatening, uh, life-saving drugs are not available for all the patients in Europe. Then people from other political groups told me, oh, we have the Green Deal and we don't have time for this. So I think the Green Deal is important and the EPP supports Ursula von der Leyen, but we should never underestimate health issues. So health is more important than many people thought before the crisis. 
European cooperation is more important uh, because we could have learned from Italy much earlier and we could have helped Italy much earlier. So if we would have looked more in a European way on this problem, uh, maybe some of the deaths in other countries would have been avoided and we, we would be able to help Italy much more. And that's why, for example, the ECP group asked to really strengthen the, the ECDC. This is our Center for Disease Control in Europe, Stockholm. It's much smaller than the National Institute, for example, in Germany, but the virus doesn't respect borders. That's why the European answer should be much uh, stronger than it was in this time. A uh, question from Leonardo Artenzi. He says, why is it so hard for the EU to find a common way in order to face a common problem? Yeah, the first problem is that uh, many member states, especially the health ministers, think health is only a national issue. That was never true because, as I said, the vaccine will be approved by the European Medical Agency. There is no vaccine that is approved by a national agency. And this European Research Corporation is crucial already before the crisis and now even more. So it was never a solely national issue. But health ministers tend to say, um, we are the masters of the game and the European Commission and the Parliament should not intervene. And I think um, that we need to overcome. And some health ministers have understood the message. So, for example, the German health minister, who was not always in favor of more Europe, now said to, to give more competence to the ECDC, our Center for Disease Control, is, is the right answer. Another question relating to the apps. Um, we know countries, some countries have developed their own apps. Is it not better that there's one app for the EU? Um, I'm not convinced that it is possible to have one app because what I just said before, we are not yet in a situation where health ministers respect a strong European role, but we need to have compatibility. So it needs to be an app when I cross the border from Germany to the Netherlands or from Austria to Italy that uh, when I have contact, that the app wants me anyhow. Even if it is an Austrian app and I was in North Italy, they should be compatible so that I got an information when I have contact to a COVID-19 uh, patient or uh, a positive test. A question from me. I'm in Brussels and I, I'm, I'm expecting some details today about uh, the easing of restrictions here, but some reports suggest that wearing masks in public might be mandatory. Um, I don't know where to get a mask, uh, get a mask and, and, and if they'll be available to everyone. Do you have any advice there? So um, in Germany and Austria, where I know the situation best, the obligation to wear a mask is not uh, in a way that you have a medical mask, but you can have a self-made mask. And there are many advices in the internet how to do this. And if everything goes wrong, you can even just wear a scarf. That is not the best solution, but it's better than nothing. The mask doesn't give uh, uh, 100% protection, and maybe not even 90%, so you still have to be careful. But the effect is if you are coughing, and sometimes it just happens, and the, the virus will already be active if you don't feel any symptoms before. So you may go to the subway or to the shop and don't think you have any problem, but suddenly you, you are coughing because something happens. You can already spread the virus and there the mask or a scarf is, is helpful to protect others. So that's why um, either do it yourself. There are many people uh, working on it. So I got, for example, a self-made mask from from the wife of my uh, my assistant, and others also offered it to me, and this is much better than nothing. A good point. I, I'll see what I have to make my own mask if it comes to that. Um, just in general, people will be looking ahead to the summer, thinking, "Can I go on holiday? What's going to happen? Is it is it safe enough now to say that social distancing is going to be the new normal for the foreseeable future?" Unfortunately, yes. So I don't see a situation where social distancing is not 
necessary anymore before mm -hmm. beginning of next year, when we have a vaccine and maybe even a bit later. But of course, we are all learning every day. So we know um, personally what we can do in providing social distancing. For example, uh, when I meet my friends, I do it either on, uh, on FaceTime or on Skype, or I do it outside in the garden with one and a half meter distance. So this is a learning process. In the beginning, we did no meetings. Now we can do it, uh, but with uh, having social distance. And the same applies for holiday. If we are in a situation where we can better control the virus, I could imagine that in some countries it's possible to go for holiday, but of course not with hundreds of people in a, in a dining room on the buffet where you touch them and fight for the food. So this is impossible and also parties wouldn't be possible. But to go for hiking in Austria, in a, in a flat that you hire and you go to the supermarket as you would do at home, in a limited circumstances could be possible. And the, the question is who will get the two, two flats that are available? But also, for example, in a hotel, it's possible with less people and no common dining, but lunch uh, uh, served as a, as a package. We need to be uh, creative and need to, to find ways and means um, but maybe for many people, the best option to do holiday will be um, at home, but not staying in the flat. I think this is very important. Whenever local, local circumstances allow and local rules allow, people should go out for a walk, should go hiking, should go cycling, because this is good for your health. And, you know, cycling is a good example. You cannot come people closer than one and a half meter for a longer time while you're cycling. You're just, uh, because of the bike, you are far away. So these kind of activities, I think, should be possible more and more all over Europe. To keep people in their flats for months is also a challenge. And whenever authorities allow or whenever authorities are in doubt, I would advise for allowing people to go out and do their exercise and do things that that they like, um, uh, but keeping the social distancing rules. Okay. Uh, Peter, I think we've covered plenty of topics there, unless there's anything else you would like to, to add to that. No, I think uh, this is uh, the most important. Uh, maybe one message in the end. I think uh, it's true that Europe didn't react good in the first line, but I'm not convinced that we can survive in this crisis without European cooperation. For research, for vaccine, for medicine, also for the economy, nothing will be better without the European Union. And I'm personally, I'm very sure that this will also be one of the lessons learned in the UK. They are suffering a lot because they thought they could do it different. I think they will come back to the table and negotiate for a much more common approach than they thought maybe three months ago. So European cooperation is an answer in this crisis. And that's, I think, the main lesson, lesson that we learned. Perfect. OK, Peter, listen, thanks so much for taking the time to talk to us here today. And uh, stay safe. Stay safe. Hello. Bye-bye.